Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our ESP webinar today on Russia a role in the newly shaped order. Uh, we, we keep uh, repeating to ourselves that uh, uh, the pandemic is reshaping geopolitics, accelerating the fragmented world we are living in, uh, challenging uh, domestic political environment in several countries, including many European countries. And meanwhile, uh, someone keep uh, underlining that the election of Joe Biden in the United States contributed to escalating tension between the United States on the one hand and China and Russia on the other. From sanction to calling Putin a killer, Biden has been uh, somehow determined to talk tough on Russia. And most agree that the Biden presidency will not reverse the deterioration on US-China relation either. We are convened it here today, I would say very timely, with some key questions in mind. What are the implications of this newly shaped or newly shaping global order to Russia foreign policy? What role can the European Union play in this uh, highly conflictual environment? And which relations between Russia and the West now at historical lows uh, and uh, an escalating standoff uh, over Ukraine on Alexei Navalny. What can we expect in the near medium term? Having in mind, as I was uh, discussing with Dimitri Training before the start, that history is a long story and we should not uh, necessarily concentrate on a very specific, brief moment of history. Uh, the one I mentioned are uh, obviously not easy question, but uh, uh, our goal, our aspiration for today is to offer a few insight into possible answer. Uh, and I will not hesitate anymore in uh, starting our roundtable, giving the floor to Eleonora Tafur and Rosetti, who will chair the session. Eleonora, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Magri, and let me join uh, Mr. Magri uh, welcoming you all to this SP event. My name is Eleonora Tafura Ambrosetti. I'm a research fellow at the uh, Russia, Caucasus and Central Asia Center here at ISPI, and I will be moderating this, uh, this debate. Um, Mr. Magri is very right in pointing at the significance of these um, shifts uh, that we're witnessing, uh, starting with, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. In a way, though, this newly shaped uh, or newly shaping order uh, kind of resemble the old one with the uh, United States being back at leading the so-called liberal order and uh, um, the transatlantic relationship reinforced and um, and you know the uh, divide in terms of values between Russia and the West uh, being uh, more and more uh, broad. Um, so the debate is also polarizing quite a lot. Last Sunday, the former president of Estonia, for instance, um, claimed on Twitter that uh, all Russians uh, should be banned from entering uh, his country and, and Europe in general. Um, so we see more and more polarization and more and more confrontation, but at the same time, there are concrete economic and political interests uh, to um, make cooperation with, uh, with Russia, if not desirable, at least rational. And uh, of course, the example of the Nord Stream 2 uh, comes to mind first, but uh, it's not the only one. And it, this applies to the US as well. Uh, if we think, for instance, that uh, the US are, um, is, is, of course, uh, promoting energy independence, but at the same time is uh, increasing its uh, oil imports from Russia. Russia has become the third largest uh, oil uh, exporter to the United States. 
Um, so it's complicated, but we have uh, four excellent speakers today that will help us uh, navigate these complexities. And let me introduce them briefly to you. Um, first, we have Odron Perkaskian. Uh, she's uh, the head of the Russia Eastern Partnership Regional Cooperation and OECE Division at the European External Action Service. She has a great experience uh, designing and implementing uh, EU policies vis-a-vis -vis the EU-Russia uh, shared neighborhood. So I'm sure she will help us uh, making sense of uh, the evolution of, uh, of, um, of the political relations were with Russia as well. Second, we have Dmitry Trenin, the director of the Carnegie Moscow Cen Center and possibly um, Russia's most uh, authoritative voice uh, on everything concerning uh, relations uh, with the West, including the, the US. Uh, Dr. Trenin has an insider's knowledge of uh, security and defense matter, having served uh, in uh, the Soviet and uh, Russian armed forces. And uh, he was also, uh, he spent some time in Rome in, uh, at the NATO Defense College as well. So third, we have uh, Deborah Larson, professor of political science at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Her research draws on uh, social psychology to explain foreign policy decision making. She's among the world's top scholars on international stages. And uh, in fact, her uh, latest uh, uh, co-authored book looked at how uh, the desire to improve international status guides uh, Russia's and China's foreign policies. Last but not least, we have Feng Xiaolie, possibly China's most renowned expert on, on Russia. He's the director of the Center for Russian Studies at the East China Normal University. He's also a member of the Academic Council of uh, uh, the Valdai Discussion Club and uh, holds many other prestigious academic and, and policy uh, positions. Welcome. Before giving the floor to our uh, distinguished speakers, I'd like to make just two remarks. Uh, first, uh, due to time differences, uh, Professor Larson uh, is not with with us today in person. We, have, uh, we had to record her, uh, her speech. Uh, so she won't be available uh, for the Q&A, although she would have loved to, but it's uh, 5 a.m. in Los Angeles, so she really couldn't do it. Um, second, you can engage and ask questions to all the speakers at the end of the event through the, this very platform. So we welcome uh, your insights and questions. I'd like to uh, kick off the conference with a general questions, question to all our panelists today. In two minutes, uh, what 2021 events or developments would you single out as the most relevant for Russia and its foreign policies? Foreign policy, just two minutes, and I'll start uh, with Mrs. Prekowskian. Thank you very much, and thank you also for organizing this very, very timely discussion. I'll try to use my two minutes uh, in, a, in a good way. So I would think the change in the US, US presidency and the renewal of transatlantic alliance together with the toughening of sanctions and political messages in response to the Russian disruptive policy is the most important development in my view, affecting Russia in 2021 and most likely also beyond. And the Biden administration is reaching out to the US traditional allies, including the EU. Washington is about to strengthen its military push in Europe, contrary to Trump's intentions. The US has ambitions to lead the international efforts on climate change and also signals its readiness to return to the GPOA process. Our trade relations are going to improve following years of tensions under the Trump administration. I'm also very happy that Secretary Blinken joined the EU Foreign Affairs Council in March, and we also coordinated our sanctions with the US related uh, in the case of Mr. Alexei Navalny. So to conclude, we see a genuine desire in Washington to consult closely with us on foreign policy, including on Russia, which we very much welcome. Over. 
Thank you very much. Dr. Trenin, your take. Well, I would say that the most important thing for Russia, as it is for all nations these days, I think is what's happening domestically. Uh, 2021 will be the year of uh, parliamentary elections in Russia. And um, although uh, these elections will not change the, um, the, uh, the political regime that uh, Russia has today, uh, this will be a very important test of uh, where Russian society is at this point. So it's not, uh, it's not something that uh, can be ignored or can be dealt with lightly. So that is important. It's also important that this election is uh, very closely tied to the uh, international position of Russia. And uh, you just you mentioned Navalny, and clearly this is, this is the link between domestic and, and international. Uh, on the foreign policy, front, I would say the, uh, the important uh, development is the, um, uh, is the arrival of the Biden administration uh, with, uh, with a policy that looks like it's going to be uh, more confrontational with regard to Russia and China uh, than the policies of Donald Trump. So uh, I would also add that uh, in, in this situation, Russia and China We'll probably have to collaborate a bit more. Let me stop here. Very important, the link between domestic and international. We'll hear more about that later uh, at the end of the event. Um, so let me hear from uh, Professor Larson then. Video. Mm -hmm. Two events. The first would be the election of Joe Biden who is proving to be a more formidable foe for Russia than Trump was. And the second event is the uh, Russian vaccine, Sputnik V, which you know has changed Russia, which has helped to change Russia's image from just a commodity producer to uh, a scientific power. Thank you, Professor Fang. Uh, okay, I think today today's discussion is, I think is very important and also very timely. Uh, to some degree, I uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see uh, Dimitri training Professor Dimitri training again uh, as uh, my very uh, my my very respected professor here. Um, I, I agree with him the idea that uh, for most uh, uh, Russia people, maybe. Now they focus on uh, domestic, uh, uh, domestic issues, uh, regional uh, election and the par uh, parliament election. Uh, that is first. The second delay, uh, I think, though uh, now the Russia faced so uh, so the tough the challenge from outside, but uh, uh, from I think uh, so far from the Ukraine crisis. Russia always faces uh, such kind of the, the, the challengeable, challengeable situation. So it is, it is, it is not a surprise for, for Russia people. Uh, what does it mean? I think uh, maybe I can say that uh, uh, Russia people, they have an ability to cope with such kind of situation. Thank you very much. So let's start uh, our uh, conference uh, with uh, Mrs. Um, Perkauskian. And let's start with, the, with a general question on the state of the EU-Russia relations. Uh, it is no mystery that they're not doing very well, uh, but could you elaborate a bit more on this and especially on the EU strategy towards Russia? Do you think that the EU's uh, selective engagement strategy is still uh, fit for purpose? Thank you, with pleasure. Uh, so, Russia is our biggest and most difficult neighbor, but also a global player trying to change the international rules-based order and also multilateral institutions, which has been taking us all decades to build up. In economic terms, there is a sharp asymmetry in favor of EU, which represents 38% of Russia's tra uh, trade turnover, while Russia represents less than 5% of EU's trade turnover. 
Now, in energy, Russia is twice as much dependent on, on the EU than vice versa. Then it comes to foreign direct investment. 75% of foreign direct investments in Russia originate from the EU, while only 1% of foreign direct investments in the EU comes from Russia. I have to no note also that Russia, in a way, compensates this asymmetry by a military posture and also disruptive foreign policy. And that is why you refer to High Representative's visit to Moscow. I believe that High Representative Borrell had all the reasons to, to reach out and also test the readiness of his uh, Russian hosts to improve relations, at least in some areas. Uh, you also refer to selective engagement. I would like to note that as for selective engagement, this is one principle integrated in our policy framework of the five guiding principles, which has been reaffirmed by the Foreign Affairs Council as recently as on 22nd of March. And I would like to underline that our policy framework, five principles, uh, were reaffirmed uh, unanimously, and the EU unity under this framework is the greatest asset in our policy towards Russia, which, by the way, annoys Russia most. And with uh, regard to the first principle, the full implementation of the Minsk agreements is key condition of any substantial improvement of our relations with Russia. For the EU, an independent and prosperous Ukraine is an indispensable element of European stability and security. And this was once again confirmed yesterday during the Foreign Affairs Council meeting by all Foreign Affairs Ministers. And this is objective in general for all Eastern Partnership countries. Now, about, strength, uh, about uh, while strengthening engagement with our Eastern neighbors or working on our internal resilience against hybrid and cyber threats, or stepping up support to the Russian civil society and human rights defenders and enhancing people-to-people -people contacts. We also continue signaling to Russia that we are ready to selectively engage, selectively engage in areas of clear EU interest, for example, climate change or health or science and technology, or on foreign policy issues. I already mentioned Iran as one of them. So needless to say that we need a stable and predictable Russia for our own security. And nobody in the EU wishes to cut the channels of communication with Moscow. And I have to underline that we will spare no effort to improve relations with the Russian government in, in long term, in full respect of our values, principles, and interests. We see, however, a constant trend in the Kremlin choosing to deliberately deepen the confrontation with the West at the moment, using all kinds of measures, disinformation, other malign activities to achieve its goal. And uh, we very much deplore that. And let me, to conclude, be very clear. It is not up to the EU, but up to Russia to change. Thank you. Well, that's a very clear message, and I'm curious to know how Dr. Trenin will uh, react to that. Uh, but I also, I would like to know from Mr. Trenin, how does Russia, both the government and the population, see the EU nowadays? Um, in particular, I'd like you to linger on the role of Germany. Gorbachev once said that he believed that Germans and Russians have a common faith and a common destiny. Uh, do you think that Germany is still Russia's best friend in Europe? And how uh, do you see the uh, upcoming uh, elections in, in Berlin affecting the uh, German relationship with Russia? Well, Eleonora, thank you very much. It's a great uh, honor to be part of this panel. Uh, I have the privilege of not being a, a Russian official, so I will not respond to uh, the previous speaker's um, uh, political statement. Um, I will uh, respond to your questions, though. Um, Russia, when Russia looks at Europe, is it sees triple. One is uh, Brussels uh, as a bureaucracy and Brussels as a common denominator of, of, of the member states. Uh, that Europe is uh, seen today 
by uh, the Russian government and the Russian officialdom as essentially um, unfriendly and um, relations at this point are frozen. Uh, another Europe that uh, Russians see, have always seen, and I think will always see, uh, is the Europe of nation states, the Europe of national governments. And there, uh, relations differ. You mentioned Germany, but uh, relations with all European countries are very different. There are countries that see Russia as uh, hereditary enemies, and they will probably see Russia in the same way uh, for years and decades and generations maybe to come. So uh, that is one, one, one Europe. Another Europe is, uh, is, is the Europe of, uh, of the countries that have long and uh, rich, often controversial relations with Russia, but these relations have so much more richness, more color to them, more stability. And then there's a Europe of uh, uh, away from politics, uh, a Europe away from governments. This is a Europe of business. This is a Europe of technology, science, and many other things. This is the most welcoming Europe. And many Russians actually look to that Europe as uh, the Europe. So in uh, political, in the political sense, as you, uh, as you would gather, the most uh, productive relationship at this point is with, uh, uh, with individual member states. Uh, in, but the, the most important part of the relationship is economic ties and, uh, um, and um, uh, Russia uh, still trades with the European Union more than with any other uh, partner. Of course, the European Union is a collection of, uh, of uh, uh, two dozen plus uh, member states and um, uh, uh, and it's collectively the biggest trading partner. And of course, in the cultural realm, uh, there's there's a lot of uh, exchanges, a lot of uh, mutual enrichment, and all that. In security terms, Europe does not exist for Russia, frankly. Uh, the security manager for the West in Europe is NATO, essentially the United States. So the leadership of the United States is what drives uh, uh, security uh, policies of Europe uh, 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 and will continue, to, uh, will continue doing so. Uh, when I look into the future, I see a prospect for, uh, in, the long, in the medium, probably no, but in the long term, I see something like neighborliness emerging between Russia and Europe based on the mutual recognition of diversity, we're different, but also mutual recognition of proximity geographically and in many other ways, uh, Russians and Europeans are very close. So this is not necessarily good neighborliness, but uh, you know you you need to to respect your neighbor. You need to respect the diversity uh, in the neighborhood. With regard to Germany's role, uh, Germany is not the best friend of of Russia uh, in Europe. I think many Russians regarded it that way. It's a little bit too romantic. I remember a seasoned French ambassador who told me, uh, friends, nations cannot be friends. Uh, people make friends, but not nations. And I think this is very, very true. Uh, what, uh, what changed is that uh, there is no longer a privileged relationship between Moscow and Berlin. Uh, this all um, founded on the fundamental mismatch between the Russian and German concepts of, uh, of relations. The Germans uh, thought about Europeanizing Russia as the way forward. The Russians, however, thought about greater Europe as a, as a, a framework within which Russia would be made more capable economically and technologically. And this, is, uh, this became I think apparent uh, about a decade ago, this mismatch. And after that relations started going downhill. And of course the Ukraine crisis essentially ruined uh, uh, the, the, the former privileged relationship. Uh, but Germany remains Russia's most important uh, trading partner in Europe, Russia's most important speaking partner um, in political, uh, economic, and many other terms. Uh, Germany is still regarded to be the most important power in Europe for Russia. However, having said that, um, 
uh, in, uh, in, in general terms, R Europe has ceased to be either a model or a mentor for Russia. So the 300 year long period of Russia's, uh, let's say journey toward Europe, trying to be accepted into Europe, this is all over. Russia does not want to be accepted into Europe. Russia is Russia. And that is the most important development of the last decade. Thank you very much. And uh, I recommend everybody to read uh, uh, the, the paper that Dr. Trenin uh, wrote on this new conceptual model for EU-Russia relation, the uh, neighborliness. Uh, so let's uh, cross the Atlantic now and let's go to the US uh, where uh, I would ask uh, uh, Professor Larson uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, the new Biden's uh, presidency, which was uh, uh, pointed at the most uh, important uh, development for Russia's foreign policy in the 2021 so far. Uh, so, uh, Professor Larson, Biden's uh, election uh, obviously, obviously contributes uh, to shaping uh, the uh, Russia's relations with the West more broadly. Uh, and the differences between Biden and, uh, and his um, predecessor, Donald Trump, are evident. But um, I would also like to underline some similarities and some sort of uh, inherited uh, behaviors uh, that uh, Biden uh, has uh, in his uh, presidencies. Dr. Professor Larson, over to you. Well, overall, the policy under Biden is not going to be that different from Trump. Even though Trump wanted to pursue cooperation with Putin, he never thought of any concrete measures. He, you know, he was singularly uh, ill-equipped to come up with policies that could be enacted. And he was opposed by the US Congress, the bureaucracy, and his advisors. So uh, really, Biden is more in tune with the consensus of Congress uh, and, and the US government. So in, to that extent, there will be continuity. But on a more individual level, Biden and Trump share this faith in personal relations as a way of solving problems. You know, Trump, you know, based on his experience as a real estate developer, thought that he could make big deals with foreign leaders. And he met frequently with Xi Jinping, called him my friend. You know, famously, he met with Kim Jong-un. And he would have liked to meet with um, Putin, but it was politically toxic after Helsinki when he um, agreed with Putin over his own intelligence agencies. Biden also has a faith in personal relations, maybe not to the extent of Trump in that Biden is more knowledgeable about interest and so forth. But as vice president, Biden met with a lot of leaders frequently. He spent 12 or 13 hours with Xi Jinping and um, Biden has met with Putin, is uh, comfortable with them. The two understand each other. And I think it's noteworthy that uh, two days before he announced these sanctions against Russia, he called up Putin on the phone. And in addition to warning him over Russian troops on the border with Ukraine, invited him to a summit meeting. So it, it's a sign of his um, predilection or you know, uh, desire to have personal meetings with Putin. Very interesting. Um, so let's go uh, to China and to Professor Feng, uh, to whom I would ask about uh, the uh, relationship between Russia and China. Uh, these relations are described in many ways, from marriage of convenience to Cold War-like alliance, from strategic to asymmetric uh, partnership. So what's your assessment and uh, how important is the West in shaping uh, the relationship? Yeah, thank you. Uh, really, I think uh, now so many uh, different assessments uh, uh, to, to, to China and Russia's uh, relations. But uh, maybe for most Chinese people, by their understanding that China and Russia 
uh, is the most important uh, and also biggest uh, strategic partner. Uh, particularly, uh, I think now even we can find not only China and also Russia uh, simultaneously uh, we face the challenge from from the West, from the particular from the United States. So I think though uh, the two nations, just like China and Russia, um, I think we didn't want to do anything just like strategic allies uh, repeat very terrible history, which happened to the uh, time of Cold War. We don't want to repeat such kind of situation. But the uh, problem is that uh, when uh, two uh, nations uh, face the similar challenge from outside, I think that is very, nat uh, very natural, uh, 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 very logic at the end, uh, they will be close. But uh, I, I didn't want to mean any uh, uh, future uh, strategic or military alliance. That is different to think. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think uh, for both China and Russia, we should uh, firstly uh, pay more attention to our domestic issue, domestic development. We still have so many problems uh, should, should resolve. And uh, secondly, uh, bilateral relationship between Russia and China still uh, need high our level. What, what does it mean? I think the first thing, uh, I think we don't want to China, Russia, bilateral relations don't, don't need uh, uh, address any third party. And uh, uh, between Russia and China, I think, uh, of course, there are also, uh, one hand, we can find a so big progress, and uh, the other hand, we also can find uh, still uh, many uh, differences. Uh, we, should, uh, we, should, we should pay attention. Uh, uh, so, so I mean that uh, not only in the field, just like economic cooperation, um, uh, and also, uh, for example, the, uh, you mentioned the strategic cooperation. We still need to do many things. But uh, I'd like to repeat, uh, uh, that is not mean uh, we should uh, uh, focus or address the third party. Thank you. Thank you. Very clear. Uh, let's go back to uh, the EU. And let's go back to Mrs. Berkarskian. Uh, you previously mentioned uh, climate change, which is a, a, a great challenge for everyone, a transversal challenge. So my question is, in this increased uh, US-China-Russia competition uh, scenario, um, what is the role for Europe and uh, what are the major risks that you see uh, for Europe? And are there any um, transversal issues uh, uh, where the EU can take the lead and uh, uh, improve uh, cooperation at the global level? Thank you for a very good question. Uh, the EU is obviously a, a part of the global order and a part of global competition. And even if we defined ourselves as the biggest soft power in the world and thus a stabilizing and reliable actor, others, like Kremlin, for example, see us and democratic values we represent as an existential threat. And similarly to the US, China and Russia, the EU needs to develop the ability to defend its interests globally and to defend them in an effective way. Uh, High Representative Borrell once said that uh, the EU needs to learn the language of power. In fact, as we know, this is not just about the language, but also about policy actions. And the EU has been defending its interests based on our principles towards, for example, the Trump administration, which was challenging. EU member states have remained united since 2014 in their policy towards Russia by responding, for example, through sanctions and political measures to the Russian disruptive foreign policy. And we did not hesitate to include China into the EU global human rights sanction regime, among other countries. 
At the same time, we invest a lot of effort in building constructive and close relations with all three partners. With the US, for example, and the Biden administration, our relations are progressing very fast again, which we welcome. With China, we are building close economic partnership. And with Russia, despite all the tensions, we have never given up our hopes that a good relationship is possible based on the democratic values and principles and agreed international norms, commitments and obligations. Now regarding climate change. The EU has been leading international cooperation on climate change for years now. We want to ensure that uh, the EU itself reaches climate neutrality by 2050. To make it happen, we have recently raised the EU's climate change mitigation goals to at least 55% by 2030 compared to 1990. And uh, just for your information, the EU will be represented at the highest level at the President Biden hosted Earth Day video conference on 22nd of April. And we expect the US along with other major countries to make new pledges on decarbonization. And we also hope to see Russia being represented at the highest level. Uh, on this, we are in dialogue with Moscow. And we hope that climate change is an area which clearly represents an opportunity for EU-Russia cooperation and which can be in the center of our selective engagement with Russia. And uh, we positively note that the Russian Federation accepted the Paris Agreement in 2019 and submitted an, uh, an updated na nationally determined co contribution. And these are very promising uh, steps. And we need Russia to be ambitious and to play a proactive and constructive role, in particular ahead of COP26 in November in Glasgow. Thank you. Thank you. I very much agree on, on climate change being something that could drive uh, dialogue between the EU and Russia. And the EU Green Deal um, poses some challenges uh, for Russia being uh, you know, one of the largest uh, uh, producers and exporters of energy. But at the same time, I think it builds uh, bridges as well and uh, opens up uh, cooperation opportunities that shouldn't be dismissed. Um, but I want to go back to Dr. Training and I want to change the topic a little bit and, and talk about the Middle East and North Africa, the MENA region, uh, because Russia has been increasingly active in, in this uh, area uh, for some time, especially since the uh, intervention in Syria in 2015. Um, you authored one of the reference books on Russia's uh, MENA uh, policy in uh, 2018. Back then, uh, the US was seen as retreating from, from the region. But now with Biden, uh, do you foresee any changes? And uh, do you foresee maybe a possible return of the US uh, leading to increasing uh, competition in, in the MENA region? And uh, in... Uh, also in the MENA region, what do you think of China's role? And do you think China and Russia can cooperate, uh, especially with regards to investments and uh, reconstruction in Syria? Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, making reference to that, to that short book. Um, I think that uh, counterintuitively, uh, President Biden's uh, foreign policy will be in many ways a continuation of Donald Trump's foreign policy on a number of uh, fronts, and that includes uh, the Middle East. I think that the, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Trump's policy in many ways that was the continuation of, uh, of Obama's uh, return home, or Obama's uh, a policy of retrenchment, as it was known then, but I can, I can even make a step uh, even farther back uh, by saying that it was evident from the second term of President George W. Bush that the United States had reached the peak of its international engagement, involvement, and was headed home to repair the much... Um, needed to make some much needed repairs at home. And I think that President Biden's most important uh, uh, task uh, of his presidency is, uh, uh, is at home. 
that that starts with a pandemic, economic issues, race race issues, race relations, uh, political polarization in the United States, and many other things. They call uh, the White House's attention uh, very much a home. At the same time, uh, Biden is faced with the uh, with the rise of China that has uh, reached a level that, uh, from the American perspective, threatens to uh, displace the United States from its position of uh, the world's um, dominant power, the world's number one power. And this is something that to most Americans, uh, certainly most Americans dealing with political issues, is not only unacceptable, it's even unthinkable. And the focus of U.S. foreign policy is very much on, on doing something about that, on containing China's further uh, uh, expansion or further uh, elevation as a world power. Uh, the Middle East is not among the priorities of the Biden administration. Uh, I do not foresee a return to the, of the United States to the Middle East. In fact, the United, the United States is is focusing its uh, foreign policy resources on uh, the all-important relationship with China, all-important standoff with China. And uh, that is evident uh, in the decision taken by President Biden to, uh, to withdraw U.S. forces uh, from Afghanistan by 9-11 this year. I see China's role on the rise globally, but on the very cautious rise, very, uh, let's say, uh, it's it's steady, but uh, it's uh, it's cautious at the same time. Feeling, uh, let's say, crossing the the river by feeling the stones in many ways, as the Chinese uh, expression goes. Uh, I think for the time being, China is mostly. I think it's for Professor Professor Fang, of course, to talk about China's uh, policies and China's role. But I'm responding to your question about how people in Russia view China's. Uh, role uh, in the Middle East. Uh, I think that China is still mostly interested in economic issues, but it's increasingly uh, also interested in security issues. China is playing a very important role with Iran, JCP, from, J from the JCPOA agreement to the recent 25-year collaboration, strategic collaboration agreement between Beijing and Tehran. With regard to um, uh, China's uh, intention of, uh, of uh, uh, rebuilding, helping rebuild Syria. I think it's uh, for Professor Fang to actually respond to that question. It is, uh, uh, it, it, it is a tragedy that uh, uh, the rebuilding effort has, uh, uh, in, has, has not started uh, uh, for, as I understand mostly for political reasons. We all know what those reasons are, and they, they, uh, they, they mostly um, concern uh, Western countries. With regard to Russia, very, very briefly, Russia's main policies uh, could be summarized as follows. Russia offers no model, either geopolitical or ideological or economic model for the region, no grand design for the region, no permanent alliances, no permanent enemies. Uh, contacts with all, be, be in touch with all important players. Uh, own Russian interests are placed to the fore, secure from security issues to economic issues, and these range from oil and gas to arms and grain uh, to nuclear energy projects and other projects. It's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's most important, one of the most important axes of Russia's foreign policy that stretches all the way from Donbass in Ukraine to uh, the Sea of Azov, Crimea, the Black Sea, the Caucasus, Syria, Turkey, uh, and all Egypt and all the way to Port Sudan, where Russia has uh, recently signed an agreement for uh, a naval facility. Let me stop here. Pragmatism uh, is the key word, apparently. Um, so let's switch to one of the hottest topics nowadays, vaccine diplomacy. 
Um, and I'd like to ask to Professor Larson, who uh, I told you is one of the most renowned experts on, on status and status-seeking strategies. Uh, how do you evaluate uh, Russia's and China's uh, use of uh, their vaccines? And in general, how are they capitalizing on the pandemic to boost their influence abroad? Professor Larson. Well, Russia's vaccine diplomacy has been a lot more effective than China's. At first, there were some stumbles. Um, Putin announced the vaccine in August before there were any clinical trials, and everybody laughed and made fun. Oh, you know, we don't believe this. But then in February, there was the article in the very well-respected British journal, The Lancet, which said that Sputnik V was 91... 0.5% effective, which uh, sort of changed the narrative. And Russia has received about over a billion orders for Sputnik V, including from um, Argentina and Mexico. So uh, overall, um, the, the vaccine helps convey the image of Russia as a savior from the pandemic not um, the rogue state that annexed Crimea. Uh, it also conveys the image that Russia still has this scientific talent from the Soviet Union, uh, that it's still uh, a scientific leader, that it's not just a producer of oil and gas. And I think it's interesting that they chose to name the vaccine Sputnik um, after the first satellite. And, you know, after the first satellite in, in October 1957, Sputnik, uh, Khrushchev said, this shows that we're no longer a peasant country. You know, you can no longer treat us as a peasant country. So in the same way, you know, Russia's saying, we got there first, you know, we're the first vaccine. Now, in China, it's a little bit different. China didn't have the first vaccine. And China is trying to uh, convey the image of a helper to the developing world, you know, a, a benevolent country, a benevolent leader providing benefits, you know, it's uh, health diplomacy, the um, Sil Health Silk Road is part of the BRI. And so it's this part of its attempt to have an image um, to gain status as um, a provider of benefits to the rest of the world, the benevolent leader. But going against that is the fact that the Chinese have been very secretive about the scientific data underlying their vaccine. They haven't released third stage trial data. And recently, um, Gao Fu, who's the Chinese head of the uh, who's the head of the Chinese CDC, um, admitted that the vaccine, the Chinese vaccines are not very effective. And he said that they should actually mix doses or maybe um, try to develop a, a vaccine like Moderna and Pfizer, you know, a messenger um, RNA. And almost immediately the next day he was forced to retract it and say that he was misquoted. But, you know, in fact, the Chinese vaccines only have an efficacy rate of about 50.5% which is just barely above the threshold for the WHO. Um, nevertheless, a lot of Latin American countries have accepted the Chinese vaccines, um, although you know, I think Chile may regret it. So they've ex also the Middle East, Middle East countries like UAES. So um, I think this helps China's image in the third world or in you know, the developing world uh, and helps change the story about how China was originally the source of the virus to you know, one of the uh, rescuers of the world from the virus. So it's, it's a way of sort of changing uh, the conversation to convey a different image to the rest of the world. But overall, the, um, the lack of data raises suspicions and it may be that this will backfire. In, in any case, China and Russia have been able to fill a gap left by the EU and the United States and Britain, which have been more concerned with getting vaccines for themselves than you know, providing vaccines to others.
I very much agree, and uh, I agree on the fact that Russia and China have managed to portray themselves as, you know, the, the, the benevolent uh, states uh, providing uh, low and uh, middle income countries with uh, vaccines that they could uh, uh, otherwise not uh, gain access to. Um, I want to go back to Professor Feng, and uh, uh, we were uh, discussing about uh, China's uh, enhanced uh, security and um, military uh, importance. Uh, China is also uh, Chinese uh, arm producers are also gaining more and more uh, importance among the uh, the world's uh, top uh, weapons uh, producers. So I'd like you to focus on. Uh, China, Russia's um, defense and space cooperation. Space cooperation is something that uh, here in, in the West and the US in particular has been making headlines and is regarded as something more um, threatening uh, in, in terms of uh, um, challenging the US's dominance in, in, in this domain. Um, and if we think about it, the security, the defense sector is highly dependent on uh, technological progress. Uh, so on paper, Russia's uh, military know-how matches very well with, uh, with China's ambition to excel in the global uh, technological race. Uh, how do you see this cooperation uh, evolving? And uh, do you think it will cause also some frictions in the long term between Moscow and, uh, and uh, Beijing? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, let me uh, let me a little bit ret return to the previous the topic about the vaccine uh, ab uh, about uh, the vaccine cooperation. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that uh, even in the uh, beginning of the sixty years of the last century, uh, we can find that uh, uh, cooperation, uh, vaccine cooperation, uh, even uh, appear even ha has been appeared among the uh, United States, Soviet Union, and China. At that time, uh, not only Soviet Union, though uh, that time we have al already uh, some, some of the problem, uh, but uh, Soviet Union uh, still ha uh, had helped China. And also United States also, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, cooperated with China and, uh, and the Soviet Union I think that is very wonderful memorial. Uh, even that time we can uh, did some of the cooperation. Why uh, now we couldn't promote such kind of the, the cooperation? That is first things. Secondly, about uh, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the space, uh, the, the uh, cooperation between the, uh, Russia and China. Uh, the first thing I'd, uh, I'd like to say that uh, the space uh, cooperation not only happened to uh, China uh, with Russia, but also happened to bilateral uh, relations uh, between the United States and, and, and Russia. So mm, that is not uh, the, the new case. Uh, secondly, uh, I think, uh, uh, of course, the uh, space uh, 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 cooperation, space uh, uh, strategic cooperation, that is a very sensitive area. I remember even the one uh, scholar from the United States, he suggested that uh, why uh, China, uh, United States, and Russia, we couldn't promote cooperation, uh, 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 space cooperation. Uh, that is, uh, that is a great, great change great chance waiting for us. Why we, uh, did, did, why we couldn't uh, promote uh, such kind of cooperation go ahead? I think is, that is a good idea. Of course, uh, still, uh, that is not reality. That not reality. Uh, just by this meaning, I think we should, uh, uh, we should start from, from uh, state by state uh, cooperation uh, in the different area, including the space cooperation. Uh, even not only with Russia, but also from the, uh, Europe, uh, but also with Europe, with the United States, I think we, we can do something in this area. 
Thank you very much. Um, I've been receiving tens of questions in the meantime, so I, I really would like to give uh, some, some time uh, for addressing them. But before we go into the questions, I would like to uh, ask uh, Professor Aldo Ferrari uh, to, to join the conversation. Professor Aldo Ferrari is the head of the Russia uh, Caucasus and Central Asia Center here at, RIS at ISPI. He's also a full professor at the Kafovskar University in Venice and uh, one of the finest experts in Italy on uh, uh, Armenian and Russian history and culture. Uh, Professor uh, Ferrari will uh, short, uh, shortly introduce our um, latest uh, uh, report, our latest ESP book on, on Russia's foreign policy, and we'll kick off the debate. Professor Ferrari, over to you. You're, you're muted. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you're right. Happens Excuse all the me. time nowadays. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. As the head of the Russia Caucasus and Central Asia program, I'm particularly pleased with the high level of today's event. Now, I would like just to briefly present, uh, as uh, uh, was said, the annual ISP report that we are about to publish. This report is devoted to the internal international link in Russian foreign policy. It starts from the evidence that President Putin's domination of Russia's politics has been reaffirmed through the constitutional reform approved in July 2020. The strategic direction of a foreign policy seems to depend mainly on the president and the small elite within the Kremlin, whose members, as we know, for the most part are personal friends of Vladimir Putin. At the same time, we think that an excessive Putin centrism and the relative neglect of a domestic politics when explaining a Russian foreign policy should be avoided. As a matter of fact, despite a decade long process of a verticalization of power, a number of domestic actors still concentrate material resources and the political influence in their hands. Therefore, our report seeks to study this situation and explores the evolving distribution of political and economic power under Putin's leadership in order to, access, to assess the influence that such power distribution exerts on the process of Russian foreign policy making. So we tried to understand who decides what in Moscow and how do different lobbies impact the evolution of a Russian foreign policy, mainly towards the European Union, the United States, China, Middle East, and Africa. So rather than analyzing Russia's relations with the regional governments, this report is based on the analysis of internal non-institutional actors, such as think tanks and other informal institutions. The role of various lobbies and individual players was also taken into consideration to understand to what extent the activities of this kind of actors contribute in shaping Russian foreign policy. Unfortunately, I don't have time to give more detailed information about the report right now, but I'd like to ask Mr. Trenin his personal opinion about this question. I mean the internal international link in Russian foreign policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ferrari. But before giving uh, Dr. Treni the floor, I would also like to uh, ask uh, questions uh, to, to all of you, basically. Um, we have been uh, receiving many, and uh, I will start uh, with uh, Dr. Treni, since uh, uh, Professor Ferrari has uh, a question for, for he as well. There is another question regarding the role of NATO and uh, how do you see uh, the uh, NATO-Russia um, relationship evolving in the, in the near term. Um, then uh, to uh, Mrs. Perkauskiene, 
We have uh, quite a few questions on this climate change issue. It's something that's grabbing the attention of, uh, of the, uh, the audience. And there is one especially uh, kind of provocative question from Federica. She asks whether it is naive to think that genuine uh, climate cooperation can develop between the EU and Russia, considering the role fossil fuels play in sustaining the Putin's government. And maybe you can give us some concrete examples where, where Russia and uh, EU, the EU can cooperate in this field. Um, lastly, I'd like um, the Professor Feng uh, to answer a question. Sorry, I, I missed the question. <laughs> no, uh, uh, a question from Martin. And uh, he's asking what would be the top three geopolitical threats to, uh, to China-Russia relations in the next five years, especially in energy cooperation? Mm -hmm. So Dr. Trenin, could you please start? Well, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very big question, but uh, I'm talking about the the link between internal and uh, international aspects of um, of Russia's policies. Uh, let me be very succinct. Uh, from uh, what I hear uh, in the West, uh, the biggest problem to uh, an improvement in uh, Western Russia relations, whether it's U.S. Russia or EU Russia is the policies uh, uh, conceived and pursued personally by Vladimir Putin. And uh, I hear from uh, many American friends in very private and very candid discussions that no improvement in uh, Russian uh, EU, uh, Russian US relations or US Russia relations to be more uh, to be that that's more correct, can be expected uh, while Vladimir Putin remains at the helm of the Russian state. Uh, uh, logically, that means that uh, a change of government in Russia, a change of uh, the head of the regime, and uh, hopefully the change of the regime is uh, the only way, the only practical way to improving relations between uh, the United States and Russia and Europe and Russia, meaning that uh, that improvement clearly means improvement on the terms that uh, uh, people in the West or governments in the West would find acceptable uh, to them and favorable to them. Uh, this view, which I think is uh, shared widely, maybe not expressed very freely, very openly, but shared by, widely across the West, makes Russian domestic politics uh, uh, very interesting and uh, very closely related to foreign policy. Uh, and um, it is uh, clearly um, not, uh, not to be ignored that the support for Alexei Navalny has... Uh, a lot to do with um, uh, promoting a change in uh, Russia's foreign policy, uh, uh, primarily Russia's foreign policy, uh, if the challenge to Putin becomes uh, overwhelming, if it cannot be stopped, and if the, uh, if the uh, uh, regime in Russia is uh, uh, changed, and uh, a new regime with a new figurehead emerges in its place. Uh, this is very clearly seen by the Kremlin. So to them, uh, support for Alexei Navalny, which is very uh, widely spread uh, in the Western political circles, is not an abstract support for democracy, human rights, a man's health, or anything you can imagine, but uh, a political weapon and it's treated as a political weapon. So that is uh, as much as I can say. Uh, on the margins of that, let me also add that uh, leadership in countries like Russia with a very strong but personalistic political regime is a very tricky issue. Uh, 
And um, uh, the most important task for Vladimir Putin these days is to engineer a transition, political transition in Russia, which would not result in the toppling of uh, the Russian political regime, of the Russian political system, and in the uh, disintegration of the Russian state. The lessons of Mikhail Gorbachev have been learned in Russia. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, this will lead to um, some very serious and thought through measures uh, that would uh, lead to political stability in Russia. Instability in Russia would not make anyone in this world very happy. I can assure you, but we are not going down that path. Again, this is this is not this is more than my hope. With regard to NATO and the role of NATO, I'll be very brief. Uh, Russia-NATO relations uh, are about one thing these days: to make sure that there is no inadvertent military clash between NATO and Russian uh, military platforms or military forces. Uh, the closer NATO. Uh, airplanes fly to Russia's territory, the closer Russian planes uh, fly to Western aircraft. And you can imagine uh, that at some point something may happen. And we must make sure that no collision in the air, no uh, collision at sea, uh, no other incidents that may occur no escalation of running conflicts like the one in Donbass would lead to um, a war in Europe, which will not be contained and which will not be contained to Europe either. Uh, so the NATO-Russia relationship is about that. This is about war prevention these days. Uh, and that's about all. It's a very important task, but that's the only task that NATO and Russia have uh, between the two of them. Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Perkowskian, climate cooperation. Thank you very much. So, as you know, Europe had made a fundamental choice to go the green growth way. And this is the EU Green Deal, which was already mentioned here today. We are, however, very well aware that we cannot do this alone or in isolation. And we are very much committed to work together with international partners. It's, it's an absolute must. And one of the very important international partners is Russian, Russia. And you have asked the question where we can cooperate or what we can do together. So think of, for example, a new path of sustainable growth in clean, circular and inclusive economy. Or think of greening our cities and moving around with sustainable electric transport. Or think about making agriculture less dependent on poisonous pesticides. Or purifying the air and cooling down our streets. The EU and Russia is also working on forests where Russia holds the biggest carbon sink in the northern hemisphere. As I know also, there is a big interest in hydrogen economy, both in the EU and in Russia, and uh, the perspective it could open up. And I can, I can continue listing the, the potential you know, areas of engagement on climate. But what is the most important, and my last message would be, is that EU, despite the, the differences, the EU is ready to engage with Russia on issues that are of our interest and also Russia interest, and where we can uh, cooperate. And climate is, is, is one of them. And I'm sure we have strong mutual interest in seeking ambitious outcomes of the three international conferences of the parties on climate, the certification and biodiversity in 2021. Thank you. So climate is important, but political will matters even more probably. Um, so, Dr. Professor Feng, the top three geopolitical threats to the relationship between China and Russia? Uh, I think uh, the, now we face the problem not only geopolitics, but also I think the climate change also uh, uh, has very close relation with geopolitics. For example, uh, why uh, between Europe and Russia so long time, I think uh, uh, 
uh, you can you can uh, 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 you can uh, create a, such kind of the, uh, stabilized the situation. I mean, the, uh, from the from the uh, seventy years of the last last century uh, 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 until until very near uh, the the period. Uh, what does it mean? I mean, the infrastructure. Uh, for energy cooperation between Russia and uh, Europe uh, had played very important uh, uh, role. Just by this case, I think uh, for China and uh, Russia's future, I think uh, uh, the, such kind of energy cooperation, such kind of uh, energy uh, uh, cooperation infrastructure, I think also will be very important. Uh, but the problem is that now we face so uh, so tough uh, the, the topic about climate change. Uh, how we can get the balance between the energy cooperation and uh, realize the, 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 the target of the climate change? I think that is challenging not only for for China but also for uh, China Russia bilateral relations. What I, what, what I mean. The first thing uh, uh, we know that uh, in middle of last year, uh, Russia decided the next 10 years, two thirds of the uh, budget income will not be dependent on energy resources. I think it will be very big change. It, it will be very big change happen to Russia. But, but also for China, uh, I think we also uh, decided we will we will uh, promote very deep uh, reform uh, also in this area uh, to realize uh, climate changes target. So uh, now we face the new situations. We should uh, get uh, a very clear idea how we can uh, more closely negotiate uh, more cooperation uh, closely on the new situation, uh, getting the balance between the co energy cooperation and uh, realizing the target uh, climate change. Well, thank you very much. Um, you, uh, I've been receiving really tons of questions and I would like to abuse your time for some extra five minutes and uh, uh, ask another question to each of you. But I would... Uh, I would really ask you to be uh, extremely brief, just one or two minutes each. Um, I'll start again with Professor Trenin. Uh, there is a question from Zachary regarding your argument of uh, on the end of the uh, Russian Europeanization uh, process. Do you think that this is also true of the people or this is just uh, for the government? Uh, then to... Um, Mrs. Uh, Perkarskiene, we have uh, a question on uh, by Maria on how uh, Russia and Turkey, with their increasing engagement in regional conflicts, uh, can um, challenge and should be a concern for for the EU. And maybe, I mean, if you foresee an increased role in uh, in the South Caucasus and in the shared um, eastern neighborhood beyond Ukraine as well. Um, finally, to Professor Feng, we have a question from Julia, and uh, she asks, "What domains uh, do you do you think? In what domains do you think China and Russia will compete in the future? Especially, uh, she refers to Central Asia. Uh, do you think that this region will become highly contentious, uh, contentious in the in the near term?" Dr. Trenin. Well, thank you very much. I'll be uh, really brief. I, I think I should have uh, said uh, uh, up front that uh, that is a, 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 a strictly a political issue. Uh, Russians have always been uh, Europeans in the sense of uh, their cultural heritage, in the sense of uh, ethnicity uh, for most of them, in uh, the sense of geography and shared history. That is not changing. It's uh, It would be stupid of me to, to uh, separate Russia uh, clearly in those domains uh, from Europe. I was talking about uh, politics, about uh, institutions. Uh, Russian politics is and will be different 
from the politics of, uh, of uh, most European countries, including, I would say, the politics of a country such as Ukraine, uh, that is very close to, 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 to Russia in many other ways. Um, so this is, this is all political. Russians uh, would look at Europe as, uh, its, uh, uh, very, as a very close neighborhood. They will try to uh, uh, use various uh, European uh, methods uh, to improve their own uh, life uh, on the ground where they live. But uh, the political realm, whether it's domestic politics or foreign policy, uh, that is where Europeanization will not reach. Thank you. Mrs. Perkaskin. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will not comment on Turkey-Russia relations as it is, as it is not, not uh, um, uh, my role to comment. But then it comes to our policy vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, we will continue engaging in Turkey as, as noticed uh, probably during the recent visit of, of uh, Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel to Turkey, where among other issues, of course, foreign policy challenges were discussed. Thank you. Thank you. That was brief indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Professor Feng. Uh, we lost him. Well, too bad, Julia. I'm sorry, your question will remain unanswered. Uh, then uh, we can close this panel. Um, let me really thank you, uh, all the panelists, and uh, thank you to Professor Ferrari also for being uh, with us today, uh, to Mr. Magri for his opening, and uh, thank you everyone for following this event. I really enjoyed it and learned it and learned a lot from it. So. Um, Many thanks and see you soon, hopefully, in person. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.